I think there's been a bit of a disjoint between what academic psychiatrists know, which is they don't think that depression is caused by something as simple as low serotonin, and what the public, and I think probably a lot of doctors who aren't specialists in this area, have been taught. And I think that greatly informs how long people stay on this medication and whether they think it's worthwhile to stop it um, mm -hmm. or even consider stopping it. My name is Mark Horowitz. I'm a clinical research fellow in psychiatry and training psychiatrist working in England. And on Ever Forward Radio, I talk about uh, my experience coming off an antidepressant, which I had been on for years, and finding that online peer support forums were more helpful than the professors of psychiatry that I studied with in my academic studies. Uh, and understanding that there was a widespread problem in people uh, stopping antidepressants because of severe physiological withdrawal symptoms, which led me to set up Outro, a digital clinic uh, operating in Canada, soon to be open in America, that helps people to safely stop antidepressants that they no longer need by carefully uh, monitoring their withdrawal symptoms and, and uh, titrating their medication slowly with support uh, from medical professionals. Uh, and we also seek to inform people uh, about the, the benefits, harms, and alternatives to antidepressants. Dr. Mark Horowitz here on Everford Radio. Thanks so much for being here today, sir. And just immediately, um, I think, anyone tuning into this conversation or learning more about you to see your tagline of an academic psychiatrist in training on how to stop psychiatric drugs. That is enough to make me stop reading and really get thinking. Um, how did you land on this? Why are you in an industry seemingly <laughs> trying to uh, stop parts of the industry? Sure. Anyway, thanks, Chase, for, for having me on the program. Um, look, I, I think the, the first thing to say is that um, stopping medication safely should be a core part of what doctors do. So uh, I'm not sure if it can be framed as stopping a, a core part of the industry. You know, psychiatry is a medical profession that aims to help people with mental health difficulties that can involve medication sometimes it can involve other modalities and a part of medicine not just psychiatry should be using medications or interventions such that the 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 benefits outweigh the harms and if that changes then the medication should be stopped so there is actually a a movement called deprescribing the opposite of prescribing medication that took off not in psychiatry originally but in geriatric medicine where people understood that medications that were helpful initially or helpful when people were younger or helpful for specific conditions, as people got older and they accumulated more and more drugs, that the drugs themselves caused problems. There were interactions with other drugs, uh, people couldn't metabolize the drugs as easily, and that the iatrogenic harm, the, the, the harm caused by medication itself, was a significant problem. And so now uh, around the world, Canada, America, Australia, there are de-prescribing networks of people who are doctors, researchers, who are looking at when should we stop medications. And what we've really done here is bring that idea into psychiatry. Um, and there are, there are probably some nuances in psychiatry as compared to other medical specialties about how effective the medications are, what the side effects can be, uh, and what the long-term um, need for medication is in, in specific people. And so, I mean, I think everyone would agree, I think a lot of psychiatrists would agree that for some patients, long-term or lifelong medication is not needed. You know, a lot of the guidelines really say that medication should be used for a few months for people, uh, sometimes longer for people with severe conditions. And so, you know, that, that implies that a part of what we should be doing is stopping medications in people for whom they're no longer necessary, uh, in people that, that they're causing more trouble than, than benefit. Um, and so I think there's widespread consensus on that. What we've done and what I've done in, in my work is focus specifically on that, because it's true to say 
in medical education, in my training as a psychiatrist, in my training as a doctor, there was very little focus on deprescribing. You know, most of my lectures were on how to diagnose and prescribe medication for mental health conditions. You know, I like my, my gag is that the, the first lecture that I heard on how to stop medications was one I gave. I, I, I had just simply never been given a lecture in mm. psychiatry on how to stop wow. medication. You know, and I think that's for several reasons. I think, you know, at the point of crisis, everyone's thinking, what can we do? And when the crisis has resolved in some way, you know, people's attention is elsewhere. That's not now the person is, you know, uh, not demanding the attention that they did before. That's one reason. Um, two, the studies that inform my field are largely done by drug companies. You know, that's just the, the reality of it. 95% of, of studies on drugs are, are funded by the manufacturers of those drugs. Mm. You know, they clearly have an interest in studies that um, show when to start drugs and much less of an interest in when to stop the drugs. And so, for example, you know, antidepressants is the main class of medication that we're focusing on uh, when to stop. There's about a thousand studies on stopping antidepressants and about a couple of dozen on stopping antidepressants. So there's a huge discrepancy in the amount of attention given to starting versus stopping. And that filters down to guidelines, to medical education, to what doctors know. So most doctors like me a few years ago know very little about how to stop psychiatric medication safely. You know, not a core part of our training, know a lot about how to start them, how to add uh, other medications, how to increase dose, but stopping is just not not an area of expertise for most doctors in general. Why do you think that is the case here? Why do you think across the board uh, or in, in such a large manner, we're seeing this either lack of education around stopping medication or even becoming aware of when weaning off, weaning down to smaller doses and maybe even eventually off entirely. Why is that education not there or is it? And it's just something that doesn't maybe suit an industry. Uh, maybe there's no benefit for this long-term medication use for people to stop, you know, in your maybe personal opinion here, why, why is this an issue? Why are we even needing to have this conversation? Right. I mean, I think, as I said, there's, there's, there's probably a couple, it's, it's probably a confluence of different reasons. You know, I think some, some more benign and maybe some more commercial. I think the, the benign reasons are, you know, you go to see a doctor, any doctor, a heart doctor, a mental health professional, when you're in strife, you know, when things are going wrong in your life. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so there's a lot about, so, you know, medicine is set up to intervene you know, in emergencies, you know, if you go in with a heart attack, you know, doctors are going to uh, pull out all their different tools and, and stitch you back up. And they're, they're right. good at that. The, the, the long tail of things, what happens afterwards, especially in psychiatry, you know, is just um, number one, people don't want to rock the boat. So you've come in, something's been wrong in your life. You've been given an antidepressants. Maybe the antidepressants helped. Maybe things changed. You're in a better place things are more stable, um, you know, doctors, they've been interviewed about this, patients and doctors, neither of us will want to rock the boat sometimes. They think, you know, leave well enough alone. Um, you know, there's no there's no obvious crisis. Uh, and so, you know, it's easy to think, well, let, let, let's leave things be. Um, and I think that, that neglects maybe some of the underlying adverse effects that can accumulate over time, some of the risks of long-term treatment, but there's nothing in your face. There's no red light going off as there mm -hmm. is. When you're in. I think that's the first thing. That, that's the human level, what doctors and patients are thinking. I think the second issue, you know, is a slightly larger, uh, less benign commercial framing to, to, to medication use and medication uh, and medicine education, which is, you know, the, the drug company is one of the largest industries in the world. They do a lot of the studies. They have, you know, their their bottom line is not public health. You know, yeah, they're they're, 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 reporting, they're reporting to shareholders. They they have commercial objectives, um, and so they have an interest in presenting their drugs as effective and safe 
and to be used long term because of course that would that would uh, serve their commercial interests uh, better. Regulators are there to try to rein them in, and there's all sorts of limitations with current regulation. You know, there's people suggest there's been regulatory capture of places like the FDA. Um, people who write guidelines in America uh, are often people who are paid by industry. And so there are all sorts of ways that industry interests creep into the kind of guidelines, guidance, education mm. that doctors are given. And I think that leads to a skewing to long-term prescribing of medication as a kind of default position. Um, I, I think, and then a third thing I would add is also an understanding of what causes mental health problems. I think that very much informs long-term treatment. So, so for example, mm -hmm. talking about antidepressants in particular, you know, there's been widespread messaging that depression is caused by a chemical imbalance. You know, that is a very widespread idea. If you ask people in surveys in America or Australia, uh, about 85 to 90% of people will say, yes, I believe that depression is caused by chemical imbalance. That's and definitely what I've heard. I've heard that for many, many years. Absolutely. So that, that messaging is, you know, it's, it's in the New York Times, it's in Time magazine, it's in medical education, it's, it's around, um, you know, just kind of that, just planting that seed really of, oh, if it's a chemical imbalance, then we need something, we need more chemicals to balance it, i.e. medication, correct? It, that, that's exactly it. So that, that message, you know, has come, it's been amplified. It actually, the, so chemical imbalance is the kind of colloquial everyday term for the serotonin hypothesis, this idea that depression is caused by not enough serotonin, mm -hmm. particularly neurotransmitter in the brain. That idea originally came out of academic psychiatry in the 1950s and 60s, mm. but it was really amplified by drug companies in the 80s and 90s because it really, as, as you just said, it really suits their products. If you think that depression is caused by a chemical problem, then it makes sense that a chemical solution would fit if it's low serotonin and they right. are presenting to you drugs that increase serotonin. It's sort of a no-brainer. You know, if someone, if someone said to you, uh, you've got a lack of thyroid hormones, we want to give you thyroid hormones, you know, not many people are going to say no to that proposition. It sounds like a very neat, you know, lock in key kind of uh, solution. Uh, and so that idea of there being a chemical imbalance that can be fixed by medication is very firmly implanted in the public's mind. And I would really say doctors' minds, you know, they... Uh, you know, I was taught that in, in my psychiatry training. I was actually, I remember being shown a, a, a diagram, you know, saying that uh, mild to moderate depression was caused by serotonin problems, more severe depression, noradrenaline, another neurotransmitter was involved, and in psychotic depression, uh, serotonin, noradrenaline, and dopamine. And so that sort of, actually, I remember when I when I, when I heard that, I remember finding that very exciting. You know, I thought, mm. this is amazing. I mean, we know, you know, the chemicals underlying these complex mood states. Oh, you know, yeah, it's fascinating information to become aware of. Absolutely. I thought, I thought you know, there was a big professor in Australia. That's where I went to uh, medical school and did psychiatry training, uh, telling me this. And I thought, you know, I mean, they've, they've sort of unlocked the human condition. You know, I thought, oh, depression is such a complex condition it's caused by life and childhood and who knows what but but then to sort of see it presented so simply and then the next slide was if it's a serotonin problem given ssri a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor which of course makes sense if it's more severe use a drug that also affects noradrenaline and you might have heard of the snris mm -hmm. serotonin noradrenaline reuptake inhibitors like effexor that makes sense and for the really severe psychotic depression, there's dopamine. So also use an antipsychotic. You know, I sort of thought, oh my, you know, amongst this this mess of what I thought was a mix of existential, biological, <laughs> social, complex conditions, you know, suddenly there was, you know, three chemicals and matching drugs. And I thought, you know, this guy's a magician kind of thing, or you know, science is brilliant, basically. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I almost think that was the moment I thought, you know, I want to get into research. If this, if underlying this mess is something that is that simple, you know, I want to be there 
working on that because you know to me it was extraordinary really um and i guess you know not just me but people in my class and all around the world doctors gps primary care physicians have sat in similar lectures and been told those those things and carry around those uh working models of what depression for example is and if you think that i'll talk so i'm you know, I'll tell you what what the facts are in a second. But if you think that, then, you know, why would you stop a medication, essentially? You know, if you think that someone in front of you has a chemical imbalance, if the patient itself, himself or herself, thinks it uh, because they've been told it on TV or, in, or in, in the newspapers, why would they stop a medication? You know, why would someone, people often make the analogy to diabetes and insulin you know if you've got mm -hmm. diabetes and insulin solves the problem why would you stop insulin you know that's that seems like yeah a, you know an anti-scientific idea a sort of you know are you an anti-vaxxer to want to stop medication that's helping it sort of sounds out there uh and i think and, and we know that from research when you ask patients um you know you're on a medication an antidepressant you're on it for longer than guidelines recommend you know, there are lots of reasons that you should stop it. Why Why haven't you thought about stopping it? And one of the main answers given is, you know, I've got a chemical problem in my in my brain. Uh, so, you know, why would I why would I consider stopping it? So so we know that that is in people's minds. Um, and I guess, you know, what what the reality is, is you know, there is no strong evidence of low serotonin in depression. Uh, you know, we we did some work on that earlier uh, in the middle of last year, looking at all the studies that have looked at levels of serotonin in depression, uh, you know, in people's bloods, looking at their genes, uh, looking at what happens if you deprive people of serotonin. And the overall evidence is that there's not a strong relationship between serotonin and depression. Hmm. In actual fact, that wasn't really news. You know, one of the responses to our paper, which was reported on quite widely, was was yawn or you know tell us something we didn't already know. Psychiatrists okay. said no one. You know, one of the lines was, uh, no educated psychiatrist has ever really thought that low serotonin causes depression. You know, that's a bit of a metaphor. It's a story huh. you tell patients. Uh, you know, no one really thinks that. Now, just to unpack that for a second, lots of people do think that. You know, lots of people are walking around, have been told exactly that story by their doctors, that depression is caused by low serotonin. Uh, if the doctors use it as a metaphor, uh, you know, I'm not sure that that's ethical. You know, if someone sat you down and said, uh, Chase, you've got an electrical imbalance in your heart and we want to give you a medication. Mm. Your understanding of that would be there's something serious going on. I mean, electricity yeah, in your yeah. heart sounds like a pretty serious issue. I should do something about that. Someone says to you, you've got a chemical problem in your brain. That sounds like a pretty serious issue, something you should do something about. You know, not not a metaphor. You know, that's I'm not sure. So uh, I think there's been a bit of a disjoint between what academic psychiatrists know, which is they don't think that depression is caused by something as simple as low serotonin and what the public, and I think probably a lot of doctors who aren't specialists in this area have been taught. And I think that greatly informs how long people stay on this medication and whether they think it's worthwhile to stop it um, mm -hmm. or even consider stopping it. And so I think, so it's a slightly... Uh, wide-ranging answer but i think there are there are lots of different reasons why people stay on long-term medication and don't come on mm. you know you mentioned a couple of times um the patient the provider the the person and the doctor i think the argument could be made for damn near everything when it comes to our health our well-being our livelihood or at least i believe it really needs to be this kind of even awareness, um, dual effort on both sides to not only present, hey, here what's going on, me as the person, the doctor to provide labs and medical interpretations 
and recommendations, potentially medications. Um, but I, I really do think that now is the time, if, especially in a conversation like this, for us, the person, the patient, to honestly, we have to become more informed on this stuff. I, I think when it comes to something that potentially could mean medication for the rest of our life, or something that if we on the back end need to or want to take less of or even wean off of, we can't go into this blindly. And so I guess my question for you, Dr. Horowitz, is how much of this really is on us, the person, the patient? Um, how much of this really is in our control? And how much of it should we know and be educating ourselves on to then maybe go that into that next doctor's appointment that much more informed to ask the right questions and to really be a part of their healthcare plan? So it's a, sorry, it's a, it's a great question. It's a really important issue. Uh, it's one that I think about a lot. The answer I'd like to give is, you know, you shouldn't, I, I sort of, I feel like I shouldn't need to lecture patients and tell them that they've got to go and do the work themselves. I would like to say doctors should be very well informed, should present to patients an independent, unbiased version of what drugs can and can't do, the benefits and the harms, trouble stopping it, alternatives, present it to the patient who can then make a decision. That's the sort of like ideal interaction between a doctor and a patient, shared decision-making, as you say, information provided, uh, and collaboratively they make a decision and how they're gonna how they're gonna move forward and how they're gonna keep having the conversation and readjust things as as needed. Uh, in this area, though, I, I have to say it's not working out very well, and, and I'll and I'll tell you see the proof I have of that. Um, at the moment, there are hundreds of thousands of people online in peer support groups getting advice on how to stop their antidepressants. So uh, there are private Facebook groups for specific medications you know, how to stop uh, Zoloft, sertraline, mm -hmm. how to stop Effexor or then Lefaxine. Um, there are uh, discussion sites like um, Surviving Antidepressants is a big discussion site. The Withdrawal Project uh, run by Laura Delano uh, gives people advice on how to stop. These are all patient-led initiatives. And your first thought is you think, oh, you know, people who are on peer support sites, without doctors, you know, they're probably going down a, a rabbit hole. But in this situation, uh, I'll just give you where I came into this. You know, I'm an academic training psychiatrist. I've got a PhD in antidepressants from King's College London, uh, which became the most cited institution of psychiatric research above Harvard while I was doing my PhD there a few years ago. Uh, I myself learned how to come off an antidepressant from one of these peer support sites, from surviving antidepressants in particular. Uh, the, the professors of psychiatry in, my, uh, in England and around the world were, gave information um, like you can stop antidepressants in a few weeks, mm. uh, discontinuation symptoms, this sort of euphemism for withdrawal symptoms, uh, mild and brief um and there's no big trouble in stopping you know that was completely different from my experience it was extremely hard to stop antidepressants i had awful withdrawal symptoms it completely upturned my life mm -hmm. it was way worse than the symptoms i had that put me on antidepressants and the place that i had got the, that i received the most useful advice was peer support websites mm -hmm. uh it was from people who, by dint of necessity, had had to inform themselves on how these drugs work, what is the most sensible way to stop them, and and in a in a sort of ironic um, way, uh, I've written some academic articles that describe what I learned on those websites mm. that have now been published in academic journals and have changed the practice in England. So today, wow. wow. Yeah, I mean, it's a, you know, I wouldn't have believed it. Someone had told me this would have happened a few years ago. I would have thought this was a, a fairy tale. Uh, but today, 
Uh, in England, there are national guidelines for doctors uh, written by a government department called NICE uh, that tells doctors, GPs, psychiatrists how to practice. And it gives an outline of how to come off antidepressants that originates from these peer support websites uh, via my academic translation into academic articles. Wow. So, you know, that it's really a bit turned my um, uh, sense of what to trust upside down a little bit because, you know, I'm a sort of a very straight guy. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I sort of lived in academic institutions. You know, I'm not, uh, you know, I spent all my my life getting degrees, uh, you know, look at the evidence, evidence-based research. So I'm a bit thrown, you know, my life's been a bit thrown into a spin by finding out that people on online websites were more helpful to me than the <laughs> leaders in my profession. So, you know, uh, you know, yeah, as a, as a sort of conservative nerdy guy, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure what to make of it all. Um, what I think but, is going on there, if, if I could add my two cents is yes. something that I, I, I can maybe relate to on, on, on a lower scale level. And that's just the power of voicing <clears throat> excuse me, not only, not only my concerns with just my health, but also the healthcare system. Uh, and really, to varying degrees, of course, being very, very open and honest, and, and inquisitive and curious um, about what I'm going through in my health. I have found, and I'm sure there are some studies kind of proving this, or at least giving us some kind of hint towards a, a reason. Um, the more that I have shared the things that I've struggled with in life in general, but absolutely when it comes to my health, especially my mental health, my emotional health, it's almost this kind of magical, mystical um, amalgamation, you know, alchemy of, of I'm helping other people, they're helping me. First and foremost, I finally feel like I'm not alone because if even if just one other person responds back, in a text, an email, an online forum, a comment on a post on social media, it immediately, even at just at the smallest level, provides me this level of, of comfort and relatability. And I, I, I literally sometimes just like just can take a deep breath. And it, it, I didn't know that I was holding my breath for so long around yes. this matter. So I think there's that that back and forth of like, I'm helping you, you're helping me. But then also, and what I'm kind of hearing in your story is, when we do that enough, we band together and we not only pull other resources and people, which raises us all up, but also we're causing enough of a wave to go to academia, to go to the medical community and say, hey, look, this stuff isn't working or like we need to bring something else to your attention because look at all of us going through it. I mean, absolutely. I mean, I, I've got to, I couldn't agree with you more. I think it's a very it's a very big shift in power in the world. You know, I think uh, there's all sorts of criticisms of social media, which I, I share. There's all sorts of dark sides to it. But I do think this is a very positive side that exactly as you say, you know, the 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 um, the way that these forums where I got all this information from came about is exactly what you're saying. Someone saying, look, I came off an antidepressant. I felt terrible in a way that was different from from the terrible I felt when I went on it. And I don't, I don't think my doctor's right. My doctor's telling me it's just relapse, you know, a return mm -hmm. of my underlying condition. But I having brain, I'm having this weird sensation in my head, you know, I got little zapping feelings. I'm dizzy. Um, things don't feel real. I'm having all these symptoms that was not the anxiety or low mood that began me on these medications. Uh, and and actually, it's sort of an act of bravery because you know, some doctor, the white coat, and a set of degrees is saying, you know, look, that's it's not withdrawal is not a thing. It's a, you know, it's a minor thing. Look, the guidelines say it's mild and brief. It lasts for a week or two. What you're having can't be withdrawal. And people saying, uh, you know, I respectfully or sometimes not so respectfully disagree. Yeah. Uh, this feels different. And, and that's a huge act of bravery because exactly as you said, then people come along and say, I'm having the exact same thing. You know, I'm also having brain zaps, you know, this sort of, very weird sensation people get in their in their heads when they're coming off antidepressants and headaches and dizziness. And I, you know, went on it because I was grief stricken because my father died. I didn't have dizziness and headache 
and all these sorts of things. That can't be my condition. And, you know, more and more people came and now there's hundreds of thousands of people uh, and that's very hard to ignore. So it's very easy for a doctor. I think there's a, you know, uh, I sort of feel like I'm on both sides of the desk. You know, I've trained mm -hmm. as a doctor, worked as a doctor, and I've been a patient. You know, you have a lot of power. It looks like there's one guy in a room and another person, but there's a lot of, you know, there's a gradient. And they call it, you know, there's an epistemic gradient. Mm. Someone has access to the truth as revealed in guidelines and, and evidence, and someone is just the recipient of that, of that, of that, uh, truth and i uh you know i think that can cause trouble when there's when there's issues with the truth that it's not it's not perfect and so i think that's exactly it's a, it's a powerful act of of independence and also i think service to others to talk mm -hmm. about what's what's happened to you because it's led to you know, these people coming forward and saying this you know i'm having a, a different experience to what my doctor thinks i'm having has led to these changes it's led to a you know a paradigm shift in how people mm -hmm. think about stopping these drugs uh, and I think you know, there are some of these patients, I'll give, you, I'll give you a specific example, Adele Framer, who is someone that we work with at Outro. She's the, the head of patient advocacy there. Mm. She began this website, Surviving Antidepressants. You know, she's a uh, retired information systems analyst you know, outside of medicine in San Francisco. And she didn't think her doctors were right. She thought she's having these symptoms that were very bizarre you know, not the uh, issues she got the medication for. She started a website that now gets a million views a month wow. from, from different people. She has educated doctors, psychiatrists, researchers on how to stop these medications. You know, she has led Go to Adele. <laughs> exactly. She's, she's a she's she's a you know she's she's a, had a very big effect on the world. She's a, a quite a powerhouse there. Um, you know, she's benefited. Uh, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of people's lives and has influenced the direction of medicine. So, I, you know, I think it's an important lesson to doctors and researchers to take patients, you know, seriously. You know, we're taught, we're sort of taught to be skeptical of patient stories. You know, someone comes in with chest pain, you can't jump to the conclusion that, that it's a heart attack. You've got to explore things. But at the, at the same time, I think you've got to listen to when people are saying things that are different to what the guidelines say, you know, maybe the first person you can ignore, but when you hear the story three times, you've got to you've got to take a second think. You know, is there something wrong with the guidelines? So I think your point about patients putting forward their voice, banding together, you know, can have a big effect. Can be, you know, it can have a revolutionary effect. Uh, and I'm, you know, personally, I'm grateful to such people because they've given me a lot of help in my in my to my health in my life. And, you know, that's part of why I guess I'm motivated to talk about it. Um, because I hope my story might help others get themselves out of the sort of mischief I got into in coming off these drugs. Um, what I really hold true is that we, the individuals, hold a lot more power and dominion over our well-being, physical, mental, emotional, spiritual selves than I think we give ourselves credit for. Um, and a lot of that, I think, comes from, um, you know, I think a lot of old paradigms, for damn sure. A, a lot of old ways of, you know, you don't question the doctor, you don't question the medical provider, you don't question the pharmacist, you don't question all these things. You're told, hey, here's who, here's who you are as a human being. Here's how you tick. Here's what's wrong, what's well, and here's the medication to fix what's wrong. And here are the things to keep up. Maybe if you're lucky with a good doctor, you know, here are the well-being items. Um, but and I speak personally to this because if I had accepted that truth years and years ago, mine's a little bit unique. Um, I'm talking specifically about a physical injury. If I had accepted those things that happened to me years ago, I firmly believe that not only would you and I not be here talking today, having this conversation, um, because my life would have gone in a totally different direction, but I, I physically would be in a much more impaired predicament. The surgeries that I went through, long story short, complete reconstructive um, bilateral femoral reconstructive surgeries. And so, you know, I had to listen to the doctors for a long time. I was a patient for a long time. And, you know, if I had stuck to what they told me of what my new life was going to look like, what you can and cannot do, and had not challenged that and had not chosen to, first of all, say no to them and yes to myself. And thirdly, to really dive in. That's what was the catalyst for me and 
wanting to learn the human body and going to school for it and studying it for now, you know, 12, 15 years almost. Um, so I, I, I say all that as like an example for someone listening, watching right now, you know, that little maybe voice in the back of your head, if you're feeling some kind of way about, okay, my doctor is an authority, my medical provider is an authority, I'm going to take that, but I know my body, I know myself as well. What can I lean into safely, of course, to kind of challenge that, but also just like my body is my body. The doctor's body is the doctor's body. You know, science is science, but, you know, as we grow and evolve over the years, as just natural human evolution, I think, I mean, I'm not a medical provider here, but as we just naturally evolve as human beings, but also the inundation of just society and heat and culture and, you know, certain medications and nutrition, um, we're, we're also altering our biochemistry along the way. So I, I think it's kind of really ignorant for us, especially the academic world to believe that what we hold true uh, in biochemistry and anatomy, physi well, I shouldn't say anatomy physiology, but uh, certainly biochemistry and pharmaceuticals, you know, 10, 20 years ago to hold the same weight without at least validating getting a pulse on it periodically. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think you make some good points that are very applicable to mental health in particular. Um, you know, I, I guess this is this, uh, um, you know, who who do you listen to? Who's the expert? I mean, I would say, so, uh, you know, it sounds like you've had uh, physical problems. I think what you're saying is actually even more relevant to, to mental health problems because, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think... Uh, the framing of mental health problems as medical conditions is itself potentially misleading. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, we just to focus on say depression, you know, depression is a very complicated or anxiety. They're very complicated emotions to experience. They come about, you know, we, we actually have some good understanding of them more than people think, you know, if you have a number of stressful events in your life, you're very likely to become depressed. If you have few stressful life events, you're yeah. unlikely to become depressed. You know, that's, you know, I kind of think my grandmother probably would have said that. Um, but now there's good science that shows that. There's clear gradients. Uh, there's an influence of your personality. If you're neurotic, which basically means, are you sensitive to stress? And there might be a bit of genetics in there. Uh, but... You know, basically, it's about what happens in life to you. Mm -hmm. uh, so even when you walk into the doctor's office, there's a few premises that are underlying that. You've been convinced that what your that your mood, you know, your hopelessness, your despair, maybe your wish not to live is a medical problem and that you're then going to medical, you're going for medical uh, solutions, you know, right. whatever they are, medications. That, that is itself... Um, there's a sociologist that said we've become our neurochemical selves. We've been convinced by all of this discussion uh, that comes from drug companies, but now is in the media. You know, people on TikTok are saying, you know, my serotonin is low. That's why I feel terrible today. I need to get a boost of dopamine. I need to. We've the language we use to understand ourselves is the language mm -hmm. of biochemistry. Mm -hmm. uh, and and in one sense. You know, of course, all our feelings are biochemistry. You know, our brains run on chemistry and electricity. So it's one or the other, you know, or both. It is sort of truistic. You know, our, our feelings source from chemical reactions, chemical abundance or depletion, really. Yeah. I mean, that's right. You, you could think about it in, you know, if you look at the brain, the brain runs on electricity and chemicals. So there must, so in, in one sense, it is all chemical. But that's, in some ways, that's a very unhelpful level to understand things. I give the example, um, you know, if a software program on your computer breaks down, it wouldn't be wise to go open the back of the hardware and try to fiddle with the circuits. You know, mm. yes, actually, it is in the circuits. That's where software, you know, does come from. But it's the wrong level to understand things. You know, I would call that a category error. You're mistaking the hardware for the software. And I would say in a lot of mental health issues, the mind is being mistaken for the brain. Yes, in a simple way, the mind is what the brain does. But, you know, depression and anxiety is about our lives, not about our chemicals. Mm -hmm. But it, even I find it's even hard to explain it to people because they're so convinced, they sort of don't even follow that. Of course, it's the brain. Of course, it's chemicals. 
and you know, on one and as I say, on one hand, that's completely true, tr a truism. But you know, I there are there are psychologists, psychiatrists who say the most important thing to ask is you know what's happened to you, not not mm -hmm. not you know uh, not which symptoms do you have to categorize things. Where do uh, these symptoms come from? Yeah, exactly, exactly. What's led you here? You know, what's the right. story? Um, whereas doctors are very good at taking a cross section. You know, you know, doctors are very useful at some things. You've got a pneumonia. You can see it on an X-ray. Doctors are pretty good at that. So these yeah. more complicated things. Especially it's patient the, presents with, not patient uh, suffered mild uh, physical or mental emotional trauma twenty years ago and has not properly dealt with it since then. And now we're kind of seeing the snowball of negative side effects. It, 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 exactly exactly as you're saying there's a, there's a, yes exactly for things that are not pneumonia there is a much more complicated <laughs> nuance, you know exactly story behind it exactly as, yeah. as you say um you know it wouldn't be appropriate to do that for pneumonia if someone started right. saying yeah. well, you know that would be ridiculous i have pneumonia you probably had a childhood trauma around a cough in the winter yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly sometimes so that, that, exactly sometimes a psychological interpretation doesn't make sense for pneumonia mm. i would say equally a completely biochemical explanation for something like mood equally doesn't make sense. You know, you're applying the wrong frame to things. Um, and I think, you know, the effect of that is to squash people's, as you've said, uh, their intuition, their, their sense of self-reliance. You know, what do they think will help them? Uh, you know, what do they think is the source of their problems? I, I often find, uh, I sort of think back to a lot of times I've been in, in psychiatry, um, and I've developed some very complicated understanding of the uh, the condition and 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 what is the biochemical cause and what what comorbid conditions. And some family members walked in and said something like, you know, they're in this state because um, there's noise above their building now. They're doing construction, or you know, they've had their um, money cut off from the state, or you know, their mum started drinking. Something that in my complicated uh, mechanistic you know, biomedical frame that I've had for many years working in psychiatry, I didn't think about. So I was sort of looking down, you know, at the brain, at my diagnostic manuals, and I sort of missed some social or psychological elements that explain what was going on. Bio so biopsychosocial is a crucial component to understanding what's working and what's not, I, I think, as both the provider and, and the human being. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, I a lot of mental health professionals will say that's that's the that's what they're using. They're using the biopsychosocial model. Other people, actually, the an old head of the American Psychiatric Association said it's really become the bio 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 model. You know, there's it's mm. it's bio in in big large letters and psychosocial in very small letters. You know, that is the central issue. Um, you know, so for example. Uh, if, if someone said to you, uh, you've got all these problems blah, 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 and you've got a thyroid hormone deficiency, blah, 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 you're going to focus on that because it's a clear something to, mm -hmm. to time. So I think if you're told, yes, there's elements of life involved, depression and anxiety, um, but you've also got a chemical problem, that's what everyone's going to zoom in on because that's something that you can uh, apparently fix. So I think uh, what you're saying is uh, is right, that people should, you know, their their intuition, what they think is right, Laura Delano from the Withdrawal mm. Project talks about people's inner compass, you know, which sounds like mm -hmm. a little bit like your journey. What is the little voice inside, you know, your your head saying? Uh, what would be helpful to you? What's harmful to you? You know, give that a bit of credence and not have it completely squashed by uh, pronouncements from from authorities. I think that's so true. Thing. Absolutely. Without without throwing without throwing the baby out with the bathwater yeah, because I'm yeah. not. I'm not knocking, you know, right. I'm not knocking medicine in general. It's there's a lot of benefit in it, but I think we've got to be balanced and to just at one extra point, the scientific frame, because I'm not I'm not saying science is useless or evidence-based medicine is useless, quite the opposite. I think that you know, evidence-based science and medicine, you know, is is utterly important, it should be the basis of what we do, but it is socially constructed. You know, mm -hmm. what studies that are done are paid for by somebody. And that means it's not a completely neutral, you know, the studies are sitting there in heaven and there's no, uh, you know, there's, there's no people's ideas or, or um, uh, uh, interests involved. Mm -hmm. what, what studies have done is very influenced by who's paying for them. And so we should, we should approach these things very critically uh, without throwing out the idea of evidence-based mm -hmm. medicine. Of course, it's just looking at that evidence through a critical lens.
Absolutely. Absolutely. One other thing I'd like to share with you and the listeners, um, just as a, as another approach to better understanding our mental health so that we can maybe go in more educated and informed and empowered um, with our medical provider, our mental health provider. And that's, I am, um, by doing a deeper dive into my physical health, my physiological health, um, through some really amazing, like, uh, went through some functional medicine labs and genetics testing last year, um, from, you know, really just being able to peel back beyond the layers of like basic metabolic health of like actually looking at, Hey, enzyme level, genetic predisposition. I was empowered with so much more information that actually directly influenced my mental health state. Um, specifically with, um, uh, it was shared with me on this, on the report of findings that I had this enzyme, a COMT enzyme that uh, acts in a really unique way. Basically, it, amongst other things in my body, I'm a hyper metabolizer of a lot of things, um, general metabolism included. Like I'm a hard, hard gainer, as we call them in the fitness industry. I have to eat so many extra calories just to gain a pound. Um, but that also is true in my biochemical functions. And the doctor asked me, um, hey, do you ever experience just kind of like unexplicable bouts of depression? And I was like, yeah, honestly, for the last couple of years, I, I've been noticing this more and more. It seems like every couple of weeks, I, I just, I'm lethargic, I'm fatigued, I have no motivation. Um, and I just, I'm like scraping the bottom of the barrel just to get through the day when I really honestly have nothing to complain about. Um, like, oh, well, you know, here, here's information as to why this is happening. You're hyper-processing dopamine. So when you go through uh, you know, a period of, of a lot of fun or excitement or a big win at work, you're actually depleting your dopamine stores in a pretty heightened level. And your body needs more time to get back to baseline for you. So in that interim, you're experiencing all those things that I just said. And so for me, what it did was, like, I still have these kind of bouts, but it empowered me in a way to go like, oh, it's like not my fault. Uh, I, I'm not, you know, I, I'm I, I'm not actually depressed. I'm just maybe experiencing small little windows of depression, having depression like symptoms. And, you know, it was so meaningful for me because just a few months before that, my wife is a family nurse practitioner and it was getting so bad. I actually had her sit me down. I was like, you know, walk me through this depression questionnaire. And she was like, based on how, based on how I answered these questions, she was like, I would recommend for you to consider antidepressant medication uh, or go, you know, seek, you know, higher level mental health help. And I'm not against it, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, seeing a therapist or, you know, seeking other forms of mental health help. Um, but I, I, but I was very much not wanting to seek antidepressants at that time. Um, just for the sake of not wanting to be on more on any medication, but also, I mean, having this conversation with you now, I'm kind of hearing, you know, maybe that was a very good thing because wanting to come off of them could have potentially given me so many other unwanted uh, negative health effects. And so that what I'm trying to say there ultimately, you know, I would love to get your opinion on this is just really the more we can know about ourself and, and, you know, get maybe more than the obvious annual physical labs and stuff like that to have a better understanding of what's going on in our bodies biochemically, that's that's a lot of unique power um, to help us kind of make the best next decision, especially when it comes to our mental health. Yeah, no, I think I think there's a few points worth picking up there. I mean, I think the first thing is to is to sit back and think about, you know, what depression is, how can we how can we respond to it? You know, what are what are our options? I think the first thing to say is I sort of like to put this this fact in people's minds. They followed forty. They they followed um, a group of people in Dunedin in, in New Zealand. It's a famous cohort study. They followed them for forty years, and they gave them questionnaires on uh, depression and anxiety and other mental health conditions. The same that they would have, same one that your wife would have given you to diagnose clinical depression or clinical anxiety. And after forty years. 86% of people met the criteria for clinical depression or clinical anxiety. 86%. 86%. Wow. So what, what that is telling you, you sort of hear there's one in four people, there's one in five people. What that's telling you is, you know, being, having low mood, being, feeling despairing, being hopeless, being amotivated, being lethargic, being anxious 
is a part of being human. I mean, you know, fourteen yeah. percent of people, yeah. you know, I sort of think, who are they? They're either you know supermen or they're a bit, um, you know, not very sensitive people. You know, or they're very or lying, <laughs> not wanting to or admit. Lie. Yeah, or they're, or they're lying. Exactly. You know, it's it's very rare. You know, that someone lives a life that is so without any uh, stress or trauma that they don't experience depression or, or anxiety. So I think the first thing is to say to people, you know, this is a part of the human condition. You know, I, I think everyone, you know, in their own little world, you know, if they've been sat down by a doctor, you know, it happened to be your wife. So it was a much sort of softer situation. If you were sat down by a doctor and said, look, Chase, you know, uh, you are, you're very unwell, you know, you've got clinical depression, uh, you know, maybe it's caused by chemical imbalance, you know, the responsible thing to do would be to do something about it. You know, you can walk away thinking, you know, I'm a, you know, inherently fragile or broken person. I need, to, I need extra care. You know, and that's the story that people carry. I think when you stand back and look at that, that a lot of people experience it, you know, it doesn't really mark you out from the, the mass of humanity. Sure. There's variation. I, I'm not taking away. There's some mm -hmm. very severe cases, you know, in people's personality plays into, it. I'm not taking away from that, but just to, just to see, it's not that abnormal. Um, you know, people, you know, after breakups, job loss, you know, feel down. If people are, are you know, impoverished, if they've got insecure jobs, all of these things are stressful. It's completely normal to respond, you know, with low mood or, or anxiety. So that's, that's the first thing. Um, you know, it's also useful because you're trying to work out what's the, what's the, what's the cause of it all. You know, there are so many different causes of, of depression and anxiety, you know, things in life, uh, maybe physical health things, you know, people's mm -hmm. diet, exercise. There are so many things that can feed into it. And that that also tells you what can help lead out of it. You know, if it's physical mm -hmm. health issues that have led you there, you know, being sedentary, uh, you know, eating junk food diet, uh, you know, that tells you what can help solve it, you know, to try to improve those things. Never easy. You know, none of those things are ever easy to change your life, to change your lifestyle, your diet, exercise. None of that is, is is easy or simple. I'm not saying that. But but at least if you understand that those are the things that led you there, it tells you mm -hmm. where, where you can where you can start to make changes. And everyone has a very particular set of circumstances. You know, is it uh is it relationships? Is it is it is it work? Is it childhood? There's a whole lot of different, you know, things to to address. Um, which is a much more complicated story than it's just a biochemical problem that can be solved by medications. And that brings me to talk about, you know, these antidepressants, you know, what what is their role? What what sort of benefits and, and harms do they have? You've mentioned trouble stopping it. Uh, you know, studies show that antidepressants are very difficult to distinguish from placebo. You know, people that are given sugar tablets improve quite a lot over a few weeks. Mm. Uh, you know, they, they improve by about eight points on a depression scale out of about 50. And people given antidepressants improve by about 10 points on this 50 point scale. So there's a difference of two points on a 50 point scale. On graphs, it's it's quite hard to distinguish between these two, uh, between sugar mm -hmm. pills and antidepressants. There are all sorts of reasons why that may even be an exaggeration because people know they're on antidepressants because of uh -huh. the side effects. Right, yeah, potentially. Yeah, so which, which can exaggerate the response. Um, the studies go very short term. We know that drugs like antidepressants cause tolerance. You become used to them, like people become used to Valium. Um, uh, they have all sorts of adverse effects. They can cause weight gain. Uh, they can cause sexual problems. They can cause emotional numbing. You know, so there are there are all sorts of of uh, of uh, potential harms. In in research we've done recently, we've showed that the longer you use antidepressants, the harder they are to stop because there's there's more you're more likely to have withdrawal symptoms, and those symptoms are more likely to be severe which is not all that surprising. If you use a drug repeatedly, your brain gets more used to it and therefore mm -hmm. it's harder to stop and, and it can be a more disruptive process. So, so you know, in your circumstance, someone like you who's had uh, experience of, of, of depressed mood, it's not so simple to say, well, the answer is definitely a medication. You know, there's a whole, I've just outlined a whole lot of ways it's more complicated than that. Um, and, and then you can talk more about you know, what happens when someone wants to stop a medication like that? Because, uh, you know, if you choose to change your lifestyle, you know, those things don't need to be stopped there. You've learned a new skill. 
uh, that can that can be taken forward that might make you uh, physically healthier as well as mentally healthier. Mm -hmm. Whereas a medication, you've now you know got something that's uh, extra that you may want to stop at some point, mm -hmm. and you have th that set of problems then to face than if you've done something uh, you know more holistic. Well, to kind of bring us all home on this, um, you mentioned it, I think, once or twice already, but now I know this is at the core of, of your work, what you're doing now with outro. So that being said, what hope do we have? What, what tangible evidence is there? What experiences are people having in safely getting off of these medications? But more than that, just like safely getting off medications and still, you know, maintaining or even improving mental health quality. Right. So you, so that, that's, that's exactly the center of what we're doing at the moment. So, you know, Outro is a uh, digital clinic. We started first of all in Canada. It's now accepting patients in uh, Ontario and British Columbia, and we, we will expand it to America uh, later this year. And it's doing exactly what you're what you're saying. We want to help to stop to safely stop people's antidepressants in a way that will leave them better off than when they were on it. Because of course, just you know, stopping it is easy. You can throw it in, in the bin. You stop your medication, but that might that may not be the best way to do it because it can lead to a whole lot of of, of problems. So we began outro because of some of the things I've mentioned mm -hmm. that people are going to online forums to get advice on how to stop antidepressants. In, including me, including other doctors. I know other doctors that have been on these sites. In other words, uh, the, at the moment, the, the the medical profession is not serving people who want to stop antidepressants well, and we wanted to fill that gap. And so what we do in, in outro is for people who are on medication that's causing them more harm than, than, mm. than, than benefit. And you know we can work that out by asking them you know, what side effects do they have, and it's 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 quite surprising how many side effects people can can have from these medications, which they sometimes don't connect, mm -hmm. because um, you know when you're on these drugs long term, you somehow you you can forget how things were before you're on the drug. Some of the effects are subtle and build up over time. So I often get people to go through a list of side effects from their drugs, you know, all the way from putting on weight, nausea emotional numbing, sexual problems, as long as they'll tick 10 or 15 different side effects. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you, you, you can you can ask people, what has happened being on the drug? Has it helped? Uh, has the situation changed? Uh, some people, the drug was initially helpful. It's the effect has worn off, which is called tolerance. Uh, Americans colorfully use the term poop out. The drug has stopped working. Um, uh, you know, or for some people, it was never very helpful. And they just mm -hmm. took it because doctors told them to or they thought it was the right thing to do which is kind of my situation uh and and between us we look at guidelines do you match the criteria for being on the drugs or are you someone who consider stopping it you know we, it's it's a lot of information you know as you said it's mm -hmm. a lot about informed consent it's not us saying you know stop the drug uh it's it's a discussion people come to us because they want to stop antidepressants one of the most common reasons people come is because they want to feel their emotions again. They feel numbed. Um, mm, I can they, imagine. They, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, it's, I mean, uh, that's the human experience, right. Is to feel our feelings. Absolutely. And I think, you know, there's a debate about how do antidepressants work? Uh, you know, if they're not fixing an underlying chemical imbalance, then what are they doing? And one of the things people say in surveys who are on antidepressants often seven out of 10 people and agents will say, my emotions are numbed. Mm. Uh, you know, what they mean is their positive and their negative emotions are reduced in intensity. And you can see how that, that is the drug working because if you're mm. a complete strife, you're in panic, then having your emotions turned down a bit can be a relief. And you can also see how years later, that could be a very negative thing mm. that you don't feel it could affect relationships or quality of life or enjoyment. And that's the number one people number one reason people want to stop magic presence is to feel their emotions again as you say that that's that's it's central to the human condition you know as i've made the point so is low feelings you know there's no we, we certainly cannot promise anybody you're going to go through life and never have any you know anxious or depressed feelings that's that's very hard to avoid uh life being what it is uh and then in, in outro what we do giving people a lot of information 
We also give them access to tools to, you know, to maintain their mental health and wellness because we think, you know, tools are something that you can you can learn, you can pick up and use the rest of your life, whether that's psychological, physical, diet, exercise, those are tools for life. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know, our idea is to is to enable people to stay well without medication. And then the key thing, I guess the, the special source is how we take people off their medication. And that's mm -hmm. based on some of my research and actually practices that are now widespread in England, but not in North America and Canada. And, and the essence of that is stopping antidepressants in a very slow way. So we know that going over months or sometimes longer is more effective than going over weeks. Uh, I sort of think of it as the difference between um, jumping off the top of a building, you know, in one go is like dropping, throwing your drugs in the bin. The worst possible way to stop them leads to huge mischief. Mm. Coming down step by step, you know, from the 10th floor is the best way to do it because it reduces how unpleasant each step is uh, with support alongside and importantly, monitoring people's withdrawal symptoms. That's one thing I haven't highlighted perhaps enough is how prominent they can be. You know, they, that that coming off antidepressants can be as unpleasant as coming off Valium. Some people have said it's even as unpleasant as coming wow. off opioids. You know, wow. it's a really, can be really aversive. Uh, it can really frighten people how unpleasant it is. It can cause people to want to go back on their medication. It can cause people to mistake that they're relapsing, that their underlying condition is returning. So a very important part of what we do is titrating or adjusting the rate of reduction of medication to a level that people can handle. You know, people are living their lives, they're working, they've got families, you know, they can't spend six weeks in bed often. And so we're trying to adjust things to allow them to keep going in their lives while coming off the drugs. And a very important part of that is that the current tablets that are available are quite large in dose. Mm. And in order to make these small dose changes, people need access to either specially made up tablets, and we have uh, compounding pharmacies that can make that up for people, uh, or liquid versions of drugs that allow people to uh, make these small reductions. And we know this is where research from brain imaging of people on antidepressants comes in, some of my work, is that extremely low doses of antidepressants have very large effects on the brain. Mm -hmm. And so you need to go down extremely slowly at the end of tapering off a drug. And this sort of sounds like an academic issue, but it's actually one of the main reasons people can't get off their medication. They, they have tried to stop. Often they get a tablet of their medication, mm -hmm. they halve it and they quarter it. And that process is not so hard. Then they want to give up the quarter dose, the, the quarter of a tablet, and they have extreme withdrawal symptoms and some of them decide they can't stop you know it's just too hard mm -hmm. and what we're able to show them is actually that last quarter of a tablet has almost three quarters or more of the effect of the full tablet much more than you would guess wow. and so you need to go down a few steps uh more slowly in other words they're sort of jumping off a cliff they can't see the cliff so it looks like a tiny fragment of a, of a, of a drug but in terms of effect on the brain that tiny dose of drug is having a huge effect. And so we provide a platform to get from that dose down to zero. Amazing. Uh, and so that's the kind of, you know, overall approach, tapering according to the latest science on how the drug affects the brain, making sure people are supported through the process, monitoring their progress and adjusting things very uh, proactively, you know, rather than sometimes doctors will say, you know, go three quarters, go half, go a quarter, give me a call in three months if there's any trouble. We are able to monitor people day by day, jump in and make adjustments, adjust things in people's lives, and also give them around that the tools that, that can help them keep well without medication. Well, I mean, ever since discovering you and your work at Outro, I've just been not only drawn into the focus on and around mental health, but just um, what you all are doing from such a unique medical perspective um, on the other side of healthcare, on the other side of, you know, 
the people that need this medication or maybe need or want less of it um, and are, you know, working independently, but also with their providers to come up with other treatment plans, because maybe the medication is making things worse or it's solving one problem, but creating so many others. Um, but importantly, most importantly, is that you all are providing such a, a safe and, you know, clinically based evidence-based approach to this stuff, because we're not only just talking about our mental health here and feelings, we're talking about our biochemistry, which I know we've been saying is kind of one and the same. Um, I want to make a blanket statement, but when we radically influence our biochemistry, we radically influence our entire way of being. Uh, and that could go south real fast. Absolutely. There's no debate. Do the drugs affect biochemistry? You know, there's I, mm. I, I, my, my discussions with the philosophy of the biochemistry of moods, but there's no discussion. These drugs, you know, uh, I think sometimes people hear that antidepressants are not much of a placebo and then think that the antidepressants are placebo. That That's not the case. They are potent drugs. They have effects on the brain. We know from scans of the brain that levels of different receptors are changed in a few weeks. We know that those effects on the brain can last for years afterwards. Mm. We say that the drugs are not that different from placebo. That's just in, in the effect on depress on depression or anxiety. Mm. That doesn't mean they're not having any effect on the brain. Uh, you know, for example, uh, long-term use of alcohol may not be very effective for depression or anxiety. It doesn't mean that alcohol is not a very potent chemical. Right. So, so antidepressants absolutely have a huge biochemical effect on the brain. Mm. And that's why I think we should take it very seriously and very and be very cautious about stopping these drugs. So rather than it being an afterthought, like it is in medical education and practice today, it should be a central focus. You know, we in, in Outra, we have nurse practitioners, we have psychiatrists, uh, we have clinical staff, because this is, we consider this to be a very serious medical intervention. Stopping a drug, you know, is not something where you can chuck it in the bin or, or do it in a few weeks. Your brain adapts to these medications. It changes the biochemical you know, structure of, of, of the brain. And you need to do things gently so that you're not ripping something away that the mm -hmm. brain is using, uh, to give it time to readjust. You know, I think that's both probably physiological and, and psychological to give people time to adjust to being on less medication. Sometimes, you know, people have been numbed for years, experiencing their emotions again. That's a process of, of getting used to things. Um, again but but also their receptors and the chemicals in their brain readjusting to, to smaller doses uh and so that's why we, we think it's a very as you say it's a very serious biochemical intervention and we take it you know being safety is our is our number one concern we want to do things mm -hmm. that don't cause people mischief and that is what is sending people to these websites that people are getting into huge amounts of physiological strife from coming off these drugs in an ill-informed way too quickly and so we're trying to make bring you know the latest research, latest science, the latest guidelines in England. For some reason, it hasn't really caught attention of of the medical mm -hmm. profession in in North America and Canada. Uh, we hope that by leading by example, that, that other people will, will follow, and it will become widespread practice. So one of our you know, one of our aims is to spread this practice so that you know everyone who wants to stop their antidepressant, which is not everybody. You know, I'm not saying, mm -hmm. uh, of course. People listening, I'm not saying to everybody out there, should stop your antidepressant. Of course not. But for those people who, who don't need it anymore or for whom the harms are outweigh the benefits, when you stop it, you want to do it carefully so you don't cause yourself more trouble. And that's what we're really about at Outro. Becoming more aware of the human experience, what we can control and how to have more informed conversations with our healthcare providers so that we both can lead from a more empowered place um, is kind of really what I'm hearing the most here. So again, I, I say thank you, Dr. Horowitz, for what you're doing and, and you're coming on the show here. And so much of what you're talking about hits home so much for me for a lot of things that I've sh shared, but you know, I'll say it very bluntly here. I've done a lot of things in my life, in my 37 years of being alive, that have moved the needle in terms of optimization, strength, performance. None of it None of it gave me this sense of fulfillment and meaning and purpose and overall like like was the icing on the cake of my human experience until I turned and faced and prioritized consistently 
my mental health. And that has been a practice of mine for many, many years now. Um, and it only really stemmed from very poor mental health, being in a very dark, scary place and just stuffing it down, stuffing it down, stuffing it down until not only did it wreak havoc on my mental health, but gave me a myriad of new physical problems that I was dealing with. And so I just share that with the audience to kind of go back to my point earlier of this is me sharing my experience. You are not alone. And if any of this rings true for you, you're also not alone. You know, so, you know, I hope this conversation empowers you to take charge of your health, take dominion over your health and to be armed for the next conversation with your healthcare provider, especially when it comes to mental health, should you consider medication, especially, um, all these things I say are kind of like the, the many components to not only the human experience, but to live a life ever forward, the whole mantra over here on the show. Um, and so my last question for you, sir, is those two words, when you hear that ever forward, what does that mean to you? When, if I were to ask you, how do you live a life ever forward? How would you reply? Um, I, I guess if the question is, how can we, um, you know, uh, make ourselves the best versions of ourselves, particularly when it comes to mental health, then I, I think some of the things that we've we've talked about here are, you know, I think in, informing yourself is very important. You know, I, I said it, it, it would be better if we could just trust uh, doctors and, 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 and passively follow them. But I think it's such a complicated world these days with so much information about. I think it's very important to inform yourself. I think it's, uh, you know, I think it's, it's very unfortunate that patients have to do that. But I think learning about medications, what they can and what they can't do, uh, the pros and cons of them. And also, I, I think what you're a bit saying is, um, you know, most of the things in life that help, I was very a bit hesitant to say this because it sounds like a tough guy thing to say, are hard, not easy. You know, I'm, and I put myself in this category now, at the age of 21, I walked into a doctor's office and I said, I'm a miserable you know, young man, you know, please solve it for me. And they, you know, and I was very happy to be given an antidepressant. Um, you know, if I could go back and talk to myself then at that time, at that moment, when I, when I, you know, uh, I was in a dark place, didn't know who I was, uh, you know, didn't know my place in the world, all those things that, you know, plague young people and, and older people, you know, I would have said to myself, um, you know, there is there is no magic bullet solution to solving, you know, what life is about. Uh, you know, uh, it would be lovely if there was, um, you know, but, you know, you've got to solve the problems in your life, you know, which is not never easy. Uh, you, you can't you can't jump around them. There's no there's no, you know, there's no free lunch. In, in psychopharmacology, you know, in, yeah. in, in, in drugs that affect the brain, you know, if a drug makes you feel good uh, or, or, or numbs you, you know, there's going to be a cost down, down, down the road. You know, it's going to yeah. be hard to stop. It's going to wear off. Uh, so I, I wish that I'd been, you know, a lot of what I'm doing in outro is what I wish I had been told as a young, scared, unhappy person, you know, the sort of information I, and, and and advice I, I I wish that I had received, so I could have made a more informed decision. Um, and so I guess that's what I would say to people out there to to you know sometimes do the hard thing and 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 to inform yourself. Well said, well said. And there's never a right or wrong answer; it's just everyone's personal interpretation. So thank you. Um, well, we'll have all your information in the show notes, uh, the video notes um, for you for for outro. Thank you again so much for coming on and sharing your, your experience and your expertise with us here. Um, and uh, hopefully this is going to impact at least one person um, that can then be the example and be the ripple effect in the community for others' mental health as well. Thanks, Chase, for having me. Great talking to you. My pleasure. My pleasure.